morning, Aaron. Hi, Ching Feng. Hi. Morning. Uh, morning. Uh, should I open my camera or just we uh, can do it later? Uh, yes, please. That would be great. Hi, good to see you. Okay. How about the, the my voice? Perfect. The... Yeah. yeah, it's good. Yeah. Do you want to test out your slides, please? Oh, sure. You're in Beijing. Yes. <laughs> It's very Hold. difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult to uh, travel recently. Yeah, I'm in Shanghai. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, not yet, right? Yeah, try the yeah. Leave the model, okay? Uh, yeah, so it looks really good. Okay, that's good now. Yeah. Yeah, looks looks awesome. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Jacqueline. How are you? Good to see you. How's everything going? Good. Trying to get the kids to sleep. Let's see. Manu has to deal with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, how old are they? Uh, one and five. Oh, I was struggling to get my to sleep yesterday. They're 12 and 13. <laughs> okay, that's not a good perspective going forward. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to uh, test your slides? Sure. Uh, uh, Ching Feng, can you stop sharing for a second? Oh, yeah, sure. Mm. Thanks. Okay, let's try. I think there's a little bit of echo from the Jacqueline side, right? I'm in a very empty room, so that's a good possibility. Oh, yeah, okay. I think it works. Yeah, I have to hide. I have to hide upstairs. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Okay, let me stop. Um. So, did you? It went by quickly. So, you did the slideshow view. Yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. Who, who's going to be the first speaker this morning? Uh, you're first, Chen Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Huh. Yeah, it just started getting really cold in Shanghai. Last week it was a, it was like thirty eight degrees, and then um, now it's very cold. It's very very fast. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> How's New York, Jacqueline? It's okay. It's pretty sunny nowadays, and getting to the chilly side, but I kind of like it compared to the really hot weather we had in the summer. Yeah. Can spend more time outside playing. That's much better. <laughs> I'm not asking about California. I'm just gonna get jealous. No. <laughs> this has been like a month or two of Sudhoff Lab neuro Zoom talks. I saw. <laughs> well, there's many of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. I think we, we adventure in all sorts of directions. So, you know, at least it's not a repetition of the same thing. It's going everywhere. Mm. So we... Um, we found recently uh, uh, that STXBP1 monkey teen is a splicing target of TDP43. Yeah. That sort of, so that, that, that seems pretty cool. Yeah, let's uh, chat afterwards at <laughs> some yeah. point. That's interesting. Yeah. Sorry, let me say it again. We found in human brain when you lose TDP43 from the nucleus of neurons, um, STXBP1 is misspliced. So mm -hmm. it suggests it's a direct target, but we haven't mm -hmm. proven that yet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I don't think we have many mutation carriers yet that you know have gone to an age where they would show much neurodegeneration. I mean, there's there's a few early onset PD cases, and presumably pseudopin is involved. But you know, it'd be interesting to see what else is going on. Are you still in touch with my high school friend, Anne? 
Yes, indirectly okay. once in a while. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, she's terrific. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that was you know the the start of everything. Met her at the at the AES conference, and then that's how you got into touch with the family. So it's very important. It's funny because like in high school, I was like, I mean, now I'm like like a cool guy and lots of friends but in high school I was like a classic nerd and like no friends and everything but like so I never would like have the courage to like be friends with her but then um now like through science and things we got to become friends much later no she's um, a great person and I met her dad he's very cool too if you've yeah. ever had a chance <laughs> oh you know I haven't I haven't, I haven't met her dad <laughs> Hi, it's Alon. Hi, hi, Sifo. Hi, Kitekui. Hi, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for the invitation to present and the opportunity to present. It's it's kind of exciting in this forum. Yeah, yeah it's really a good pleasure. I was just thinking maybe it's winding down, but it looks like maybe Shanghai will have more lockdowns and things will so we'll probably have to keep that going. <laughs> <laughs> it's few more months to go, I believe, still. Yeah. Uh, maybe 2024. It'll be better. No, 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 no. <laughs> definitely not 24. <laughs> so really oh, so yeah. It's very like three anniversary. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Well, they said Shanghai will just lock down for, what is it, three days? And then, the, and then that was like a few months ago. And then it was... Seven. Yeah, it's not 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 ready. Just be, because it's huge city, so unless it's locked down like a few weeks, otherwise it's not as bad. So yeah, I guess that's just to let it be. Yeah, I'm not sure whether the policy would be changed before the end of the year. Hopefully. Yeah. But they did now. It's a ten day quarantine, which is which is tough. Mm -hmm. I just came back um, September. Ah, yeah. It's yeah, seven plus three, right? It's just yeah, 10 days. But, this, so, mm. but the 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 policy is seven plus three, but in reality it's just ten because your apartment won't let you back in after seven. So in reality it's just ten. It's not high actually as the most places it's still fine. You can get the, you can go to restaurant, mall. As usual, yeah. As long as not the uh, occasionally you've been to somewhere, <laughs> you yeah. know, lockdown I, region. I went to um, Nanjing Road, Nanjing Lu last night. For yeah, a really yeah. nice restaurant. Yeah, yeah. It was cool. Yeah, be there. Mm -hmm. But I've been wanting to go to Beijing, but it's it, like if I pop up my um, yeah, no way, no way. Thing, it says like you, you need to wait to, last week. My, yeah, my code says, like, you can't go to Beijing. Uh, the joke yeah. is you cannot even think about it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> or you have a thought, you pop up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, as long as that's a case, just uh, in, in in that place, you, you have to you just get get quarantined for seven days at home. That's crazy. Yeah. One thing I stopped, I stopped, um, or because every time you go into a building, you have to scan this code. So yeah, I, yeah. I figured like, <laughs> so I've been doing that, like not scanning it, just showing them the green code. And uh -huh. then um, maybe that works nine out of 10 times. And then they'll say, oh, you have to scan it and I'll scan it. Yeah. When we'll scan it, you leave a mark. Yeah, exactly. So well, for where to go. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> chase you down. <laughs> yeah. Right. I guess they could really, in reality, they don't need that code to chase you down. I mean, yeah, you, might, you might, because it's, if somebody positive got into the building, they will chase me down. Everybody have been there yeah, within the huh? last two days and yeah. um, they are locked down. Yeah. Uh, it's quite funny is how the IT technology has been evolved, evolved during the last two, three years. I never think about it before, how things can work this fast. Uh, all the internet company is working out, don't worry. 
And then I went to Zhejiang, and like it's、mm-hmm. sort of annoying because they don't accept the Shanghai PCR、oh, test.、Yeah. So <laughs> they literally stopped, pulled us over on the side of the road, and like made us do a PCR yeah, test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've been to Qing Qingdao. I have a do the test right after getting into the airport and、uh, the、mm-hmm. highway station. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't even check my PCR test results anymore because I know if it's positive,、yeah. they'll just come and take me away. <laughs> yeah, the chance is almost like no. Yeah, is it college student in Stanford or already come back to the huge classes? Right, I was in normal.、Um, yeah, everything is normal. Yeah, it seems、right. like basically everything is normal. Yeah, yeah. My lab guys are still wearing masks for the most part、um, mm-hmm. indoors, but seminars、mm-hmm. are back、mm-hmm. and things. Sure. All right, I'm going to get it started. Yeah, great. Okay,、um, welcome everyone. It's good to see you for another week of NeuroZoom back in Shanghai. And、um, we have Jacqueline and Chingfeng coming up, but I want to advertise、uh, the talks that we have coming up next week.、Uh, please tune in. We have、uh, Yue Chingfeng,、uh, a Shanghai alum who's now at Columbia University, and、uh, Rohe Yasuda、uh, talking. So don't miss those awesome talks next week, and keep letting us know if you want to present your research.、Uh, with that.、Uh, Zilong can introduce our first、uh, speaker, Chingfeng. Okay, it's my great pleasure to start another series of Ion Alumni series. So along with the next uh, uh, week speaker, Yue Qing. So Chingfeng is also a Ion Alumni. So Chingfeng has got her uh, his uh, bachelor degree actually actually from、uh, medical school of Wudan, so Shanghai Medical School. So Chingfeng has started out with physician training. So、uh, but after a bachelor degree, Chingfeng went to Ion. That was that was back to 2007, right? So working with uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Zhang Xu,、uh, working with the somatosensory system in spinal cord, and and the end of his、uh, PhD thesis has made an interesting discovery, where an interesting、uh, molecule called the FGF13 has played interesting role on developing early brain development, as well as the,、uh, in, in the intellectual、uh, implication in、uh, intellectual disabilities. We have made a very amazing、uh, cell paper in 2012. So after、uh, PhD, Chingfeng went to Hopkins to work with the、uh, Hong Junzong.、Uh, started with his journey with stem cells. Chingfeng、uh, started learning all kinds of stem cells, but instead of uh, uh, traditional stem cells, Chingfeng focusing on some、um, uh, their stem cells within the adult brain as well as the、uh, subthalamus、uh, nucleus. So in 2018, so Chingfeng started his own lab. In、um, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing,、uh, Institute of Genetics and Developmental Biology. So, in a few years, and Chingfeng has his own lab has made a series of discovery, has made,、uh, along with stem cells, and uh, uh, as well as an interesting discovery. So、uh, today, Chingfeng will talk about some some interesting、uh, tumor I have never heard about. I'm trying to explain it. It's、uh, modeling a cranial、uh, feral glioma. Uh, uh, for high throat drug to screening, I have no idea what kind of tumor it is. I'm I'm no, I'm sure there's interesting tumor happening in the brain. Chief、uh, will talk about how to use the his stem cell、uh, screening assay to try to screen a new drug for it. Okay, Chief、um, will take it away. Okay,、uh, let me share my、uh, slides. <clears throat> okay, okay, sorry. So thanks for Zilong's nice introduction. I would also,、uh, I would like to also、uh, just、uh, express my appreciation for Zilong and Aaron's invitation to、uh, give a talk here. It is my great honor. And today I'm going to introduce the, a tumor, a cranial pharyngioma. This is tumor in between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And、uh, first, please allow me to express my、uh, just、uh, to int- give a brief introduction of the research interest in our laboratory. And we mainly focus on the、uh, hypothalamus development uh, uh, function, 
and uh, hypothalamus related disease, uh, we are uh, interested in just how the neuronal diversity is generated within the hypothalamus, how neurons are organized into a nuclear brain structures such as thalamus and hypothalamus, and how hypothalamic neurons regulate feeding and energy metabolisms, and how to model and treat hypothalamus related disease, including cranial pharyngioma. And given my training background in neurodevelopment, I frequently think of questions from the perspective of neurostone cells. As per the developmental timing of the hypothalamus, there exist embryonic hypothalamic progenitors and postnatal hypothalamic stem cells. And last year, we published a cell stem cell paper, and we have uh, demonstrated that hypothalamic progenitor cells, intermediate progenitor cells, and nascent neurons along the cellular hierarchy uh, collectively contribute to the generation of neuronal diversity in hypothalamus, uh, which contains a striking heterogeneity of neurons. And we define that strategy as cascade diversifying model. And this model is quite different from the predetermined model employed by cortical progenitor cells. And uh, in, in this model, we thought that uh, the hypothalamus progenitors may be homogeneous. Afterwards, we realized that hypothalamic progenitor cells are not homogeneous. There might be uh, multiple sublineages in the developing hypothalamus, uh, but the sublineages uh, remain to be identified. And recently, we identified a TBX3 sublineages. Uh, which is located in the acroterminal domain of the developing hypothalamus. And we found that uh, TBX3 progenitors can give rise to multiple subtypes of peptidergic neurons in the hypothalamus, including uh, KNDY neurons expressing TAC2 and KIS1, AGRP neurons, pump neurons, SST neurons, and so on. And the, this work has been, uh, we also just uh, demonstrated uh, the hierarchical uh, deployment of TBX3 in dictating the neuronal identity to regulate uh, puberty onset. And this work has been accepted by Science Advance recently. And uh, besides, it is also very fascinating to understand the properties of the adult hypothalamic stem cells. Hypothalamic tennis sites along the third our uh, ventricles have been regarded as a third population of adult neurostone cells. They predominantly uh, self-renew themselves and may produce a small number of glial cells or neurons just during adulthood, but they are very productive in producing neurons at early, uh, just the postnatal stage uh, from the P0 to P P7. So, and then what's the function of these hypothalamic tennisites? Previous studies suggest that uh, uh, tennisites mediate the diffusion of blood bone molecules into the brain, uh, regulate feeding and energy metabolisms, and precisely control the neuroendocrine output, uh, uh, including the oxytocin, vasopressin, thyroid, stimulat uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, and so on. And given that uh, tennis sites serve as somatic stem cells and play uh, critical roles in regulating many physiological functions, it is fundamentally important to understand how tennis sites maintain themselves and to what extent the disturbance of such homeostasis contribute to disease such as cancer. Uh, and we have, recently, we have also recently uh, revealed the regenerative and tumorigenic potential of tennis sites. We provided a few interesting findings. First, the adult tennis sites are largely quiescent, but quickly enter the cell cycle upon tissue injury for regeneration. And tennis sites depend on the IGF-1 receptor signaling to maintain themselves. And third, it is very interesting that adult tennis sites could transform into the uh, tumor cells upon BRAP oncogenic activation. Now we can cut to the chase to talk about cranial pharyngioma. And this is tumor in between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Uh, cranial pharyngioma can be subdivided into two subtypes. Uh, at mentinometer subtype ACP and papillary subtype PCP. And ACP frequently uh, carries CTNMB1 mutation, uh, whereas the PCP, most of PCP patients harbor BRAF mutations. PCP are a dot onset tumor and much more aggressive than ACP. 
Many cranial pharyngioma patients display uh, endocrine disorders, for example, uh, excessive urination and fatigue, metabolic disorders such as obesity, and vision problems because of the uh, occupying effects, headaches, and mood swings. The cellular origin of cranial pharyngioma has long been enigmatic. Clinical studies suggest that the cranial pharyngioma may originate from pituitary stem cells uh, in the pituitary or the tenocytes in the hypothalamus. And these cells are just uh, reside along the hypothalamus pituitary axis. Uh, while Dr. Martinez Barbara's lab found that the pituitary stem cells, uh, uh, just, uh, a, just ACP may originate from the pituitary stem cells, our lab has recently demonstrated that Rex tenocytes uh, may serve as the cell operation for PCP, which will allow us to uh, model cranial pharyngioma in animal models. Uh, it is notable that there's no other therapeutic approach than surgical resection in treating cranial pharyngioma. Uh, given the spatial location of the uh, cranial pharyngioma, we could expect that uh, it is very dangerous to remove tumors that uh, are infiltrate into the hypothalamus. Therefore, we think that it is imperative and important to, to develop drugs to treat cranial pharyngioma. The first step is to model our cranial pharyngioma with animals. We have already identified the tennis size as the cell operation for cranial pharyngioma for PCP. And now we need to understand the, the mutational landscape of the cranial pharyngioma. To gain a comprehensive view of the mutation landscape of the cranial pharyngioma, we collected uh, uh, 17 PCP and 13 ACP samples for whole axon sequencing. And this is the uh, just the PCP uh, patients, the, the MRI imaging uh, uh, for that. And uh, uh, this is the like they just uh, I think uh, uh, this is parenchymal tissues just uh, without the cystic structures. For the ACP, you can observe a lot of the cystic structures within the ACP. And given the recurrent properties of the genomic abnormalities uh, among various brain tumors, we focused on 58 oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that are associated with multiple brain tumors and identified 293 somatic mutations within the uh, coding regions of the 44 selected genes. Consistent with previous studies, we uh, confirmed that uh, most of the PCP patients uh, harbor BRAF B600E mutations, uh, whereas the ACP patients uh, have multiple mutations exclusively in the exon 3 of the CTNMB1 gene. And further pairwise correlation analysis of the 44 genes with detectable somatic mutations reveal that uh, BRAF mutation is, uh, is positively are correlated with B10 mutations, but mutually exclusive with CTNMB1 genes. Therefore, we think that B10 could be a second hit genes beyond BRAF mutations in the PCP patients. And as, as aforementioned, we uh, have revealed the Rex positive tennis size as the cell operation for PCP. The TD tomato label cells uh, are the uh, tennis sites. Uh, just uh, at the uh, bottom of the third ventricle. When we introduced the BRAF mutations into the Rex tenocytes, we could observe uh, a neoplasm in the median eminence of the hypothalamus at two months post-infection. However, the tumor growth is very, very limited. Uh, even we extended the time window to one year, the tumor is still very small. This is very uh, different from the uh, just tumor size uh, uh, from the clinical uh, just clinical patients. Uh, from the magnetic resonance imaging, we could also observe the spatial restriction of the tumors bearing a single BRAF mutations. However, when we introduced both BRAF and P10 mutations. RBP into the uh, just tennis size, we could observe a robust increase in the tumor size. Regarding the pathological features, uh, the tumors bearing two mutations uh, resemble that of the PCP. And after in this talk, uh, we are just we will abbreviate the just tumors with a single BRAF mutations as RB, and for the uh, tumors with uh, two mutations as, as RBP. 
it is worthwhile to mention that introduction of the mutations into the ependymal cells labeled by FOXJ1 Korea and uh, the TBX3 uh, positive canicides will not introduce, induce any tumors within the brain. For the RBP animal models, uh, we could observe that uh, the tumor grow very, very fast, uh, and the tumors can could occupy the whole hypothalamus at two months post induction. As compared with the cells in RB animal models, the tumor cells uh, from the RBP models are uh, just up immunopositive for SOX2, SOX9, nesting, and vimentin. Given that, the, given that these proteins are well characterized uh, neural stem cell markers, we think that uh, just the tumor cells uh, display a robust stemness feature in animal models. We also, also observe a substantial fraction of the tumor cells in human PCP samples are, are just immunopositive for SOX2 and SOX9 and Vimentin. <clears throat> and uh, next, we <clears throat> try to uh, just to understand whether the mouse models can recapitulate the core symptoms of the uh, cranial pharyngioma patients. We evaluated the metabolic and endocrine disorders uh, just indicate, and the endocrine indicators. And uh, our results showed that the body weight and fat mass were significantly, significantly increased in both animal models, whereas the energy expenditure and the physical activity during the dark phase were uh, strikingly reduced, regardless of male or females. Regarding the endocrine disorders, we found that most of the animals, uh, just the animal models, display uh, the an excessive urination and increased water intake. And this could be caused by the reduced level of circulating vasopressin, AVP. AVP is a very famous hormone released uh, by the uh, AVP neurons uh, residing in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. We could also observe a significant reduction in the uh, serum thyroid stimulating hormone, but the other hormones such as the growth hormone, gonadotropin hormone, and cortisol were not changed. And also given that uh, just uh, the occupying effect of the large hypothalamus tumor uh, many of the animals uh, display uh, the, the vision problems, such as the blindness. This is summary of the phenomic analysis of the animal models. And we analyzed the, both the male and female animals, and this is the full change, and this is the, uh, just the p-value analysis for this uh, study. To further uh, analyze the transcriptomic similarity between animal mod, uh, just mouse tumors and human PCP, we uh, just performed the bulk only sequencing of the samples collected from the RB animals, RBP animals, uh, human P ACP, and human PCP. Principal component analysis, Pearson correlation analysis, and dif differential gene expression analysis revealed that uh, uh, the tumors from the RB and RBP resemble that of PCP, but not ACP. We also identified 139 transcriptional programs shared among RB, RBP, and PCP, uh, including protein kinase activity, extracellular matrix, uh, vesicle mediated transport, and so on. Further CAC pathway analysis and the mode of action analysis suggest quite a few uh, potential drug targets, including kinase signaling pathway, MAP kinase signaling, CAT ion homeostasis, and calcium signaling pathway. Uh, now we have already addressed that the animal models we generated resemble uh, the cranial pharyngioma at the histological, phenomic, and the transcriptomic levels. And then we can proceed to do the drug screening. For drug screening, we uh, micro dissected the tumors from the animal models at two months post induction, culture the cells in vitro to expand the tumor cell pool, then seeded the cells into the 384 well plate, and then added the chemicals into the uh, cells with a robotic platform. And uh, lastly, we will uh, uh, perform the cell viability assay to test uh, the anti-tumor uh, drug efficacy. 
The, the library uh, contains 3,097 FDA approved chemicals. We use two different strategies to do the drug screening. Uh, screening with single compound or combined with a powerful BRAF inhibitor, Debrofenib. After collecting the data and using 93 uh, of killing efficiency as a cutoff value, we identified 15 chemicals from the SD group and 73 chemicals from the uh, combined compound group. And many of these chemicals overlap with each other. So, and for these chemicals, uh, they're uh, just, uh, I think just uh, these chem many of these chemicals are uh, inhibitors of receptor tyrosine kinase and uh, channel blockers and antibiotics. Uh, these chemicals also target uh, other biological process or signaling pathway, but less than 50%. Next, we selected eight top chemicals from the screening to do, uh, to do the in vitro validation. And for these chemicals, uh, just uh, we found that uh, the uh, anti-tumor efficacy of the drug alone is comparable with that uh, uh, combined with uh, Dabrofenib. And then to do the in vitro validation, we generated uh, seven cell lines from the RBP animal models, which could be passaged over 20 generations. We found that uh, all of these chemicals are very potent in uh, inducing tumor cell death in vitro. We also just, uh, uh, just uh, assessed uh, the IC50 curve for these chemicals to determine their half maximal inhibitory concentration. And then just uh, we, select, we further selected three of the uh, chemicals to do the in vivo validation. And these three chemicals uh, have different drug targets. And then to do that, we uh, induced the tumor for 15 days uh, and or one month or two months of, by tamoxifen injection, and then treated the uh, animals uh, with drugs for one month and then collected the tissues to analyze the anti-tumor efficacy. For the short-term induction group, uh, we labeled the tumor cells uh, with PD tomato. And uh, after, uh, at 15 days after uh, just, uh, uh, just tumor induction, the tumor is relatively small, but we have already found that uh, the, the chemical SAB and BG are much more potent than CR. For the medium or long-term induction groups, uh, we label the tumor cells with fermentin. And we also uh, com we further confirmed that the, the anti-tumor efficacy of the BG and SAP in treating PCP leg tumors, which could be administered to the human patients in the near future. So this is the control. You can see the very, very uh, big tumors occupying the whole hypothalamus. And after the drug treatment, you could uh, find a, a significant tumor regression just uh, in the hypothalamus. And this is the statistical analysis. So this is summary of the our uh, of this study. The first uh, the, we performed whole exon sequencing and revealed uh, the mutation landscape of the cranial barrageoma. Uh, here we identify P10 as a second hitching in pathogenesis of the PCP. And then uh, for the uh, just uh, the tumor in animal models bearing of uh, two mutations resemble the PCP in histology and molecular features, uh, including. Uh, many of the well-established uh, neural stem cell markers, and uh, uh, the just uh, the as as per the just the phenomics, we found that uh, the PCP animal models can recapitulate the metabolic and endocrine disorders in the human PCP patients. We also analyzed uh, just uh, their transcriptomic features and found that the transcriptome of the tumor in animal models is similar to that. Uh, that of PCP rather than ACP. For the moral, we performed high throughput drug screening and identified 74 chemicals with potential potency in inducing tumor regression. And we uh, confirmed uh, just uh, two of the chemicals, SAP and BG, are very efficient to reduce the tumor size. Okay, uh, that's the uh, just uh, uh, all of the, my uh, talk today. I would like to accept any of the questions. Great, thanks Tim for a beautiful talk, amazing discovery. Now open questions. That's very thorough work. A quick word, quick question for the, I'm kind of curious about the, the upstream of the 
uh, mutation of the BRAF and P10, it seems very high uh, percentage regarding to the somatic mutation. Do, don't you think? Like forty uh, percent and thirty uh, percent is P10 yeah. mutation with, along with the somatic. So how how that can be? So uh, is, is that really somatic or is that some kind of uh, driver gene and the upstream or what what, ha what happened to this uh, kind of uh, hypothalamus the stem cells, right? It, I, I'm thinking. Why the so high percentage of the mutation, uh, single point oh. mutation, where it accumulates? In, in yeah, there. yeah. Just uh, for the BRF mutations, it has already been. Uh -huh. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think previous studies have already suggested that <clears throat> most, maybe more than ninety percent of the patients carry the BRF B six hundred E mutations. So mm -hmm. I think I think that's very very high just for the PCP patients. It's it's very similar for the CTNMP one. Uh, uh, just for the ACP patients, most of the mm -hmm. ACP patients also carry the CTNMP one mutations in the exon three. So I think uh, uh, that's all right. I think that's those, those data are very solid. We just we we also collect the many of the samples and confirm the just the, the results of those studies. Here we just uh, uh, identified the just uh, uh, a significant correlation between BRF mutation and P10 loss of function mutations here. So I think the that's yeah. Th th so uh, we yeah for this study we did not collect the efficient number of the blood samples as the uh, controls. We just used uh, just many different uh, uh, public database to, uh, as the control to identify the P10 mutations in the PCP patients. But uh, we think that uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, these both of the BRAF and P10 mutations are very, very important for inducing uh, a papillary cranial pharyngioma. <clears throat> and I think just uh, uh, using the, uh, um, the animal models, we, we introduced uh, both mutations in many different mm -hmm. cell types, including the tennisites, ependymal cells, and uh, uh, the, I mean, just uh, we, we just both the Rex tennisites and the TBX3 tennisites and pituitary stone cells. We only found that when we introduced the mutations into the Rex positive tennisites, we could uh, uh, just identify a tumor uh, uh, in uh, hypothalamus, mm -hmm. but not the other cell mm -hmm. type. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe it's. Uh... So it's truly so systematic mutation, but I'm I'm mean, enriched in particular this, this group of uh, PCP patients, right? Yeah, I think just the, that somatic uh, mutation. Okay, okay, you, you okay, okay. Detect the mutation in the blood sure, cell. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. Okay, no more questions. And more questions. Yeah, this is the very uh, relatively just a. Uh, 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 just I think uh, not a well known just a tumor. Oh, so I think just most yeah, of yeah. The people were not very interested in this study. <laughs> That's very. Is that something to do with the stem cells? Uh, so you got in the nervous system and just nervous and the endocrine, you see the AVP screening. So is that just come the cells that grow faster, uh, larger than they, they press the, uh, the, the, the neurons away? Or, or, impaired the neural function. Oh yeah, I think so. Just uh, yeah. Okay. So so I think all of the just the phenotypes we observed in those mm. animals are mm. caused by the mm. just uh, I mean just the impaired function of the neurons, mm. especially mm. the mm. endocrine neurons. But uh, I mean, mm. uh, I think just uh, at the early uh, stage of the of the uh, just uh, of the tumor. Uh, growth. So I think mm -hmm. just the, the animals looks good, but at the late stage, the uh, the endocrine uh, function of the hypothalamic neurons will be impaired uh, more and more mm -hmm. severely. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Right. It's more related with, with maybe you get more question with the tumor tumor fields. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. Yes. All right. So yeah. um, oh yeah, yes, question uh, chat bar. Just a second, just a second. It says subsidiarity. Okay, great. Uh, so some comments, all right.
the fact to accumulate. Yeah, thanks. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, I just wanted to now. make a comment that I, I liked you. it a lot. Yeah. I had a question, but it was really good and very nicely presented. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rob. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Okay. So, so, Bojit is, uh, is a famous neuropathologist, and he, he's probably seen many craniopharyngiomas. Yeah. Great, his, great, great, great. Wow. Service. Yeah, I, I liked it a lot, and especially relevant for like inoperable uh, tumors. And you have those two compounds that you showed at the end that have great translational potential. So, I think great job. Yeah, hopefully, just uh, we, we just need to uh, I think recruit the, some of the patients we are. Who are willing mm -hmm. to just uh, uh, treat to be treated with the chemicals? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good talk. Okay. okay. I need sure. to stop by sharing. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Qingfang. Great talk. And now it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Bray from uh, Weill Cornell Medical College. Uh, Jacqueline did her um, undergraduate and PhD training at Gotha University in Frankfurt, Germany, then uh, came to do a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Tom Sudhoff, uh, first in Dallas and then at Stanford, where she um, had a, an amazingly productive uh, postdoc working um, mainly on the uh, normal function of uh, alpha synuclein. Alpha synuclein is this mysterious protein. It's only a 140 amino acids. It plays a major role in neurodegenerative disease. It also has a normal function that remained elusive until uh, Jacqueline and her colleagues in the Sudoff lab discovered that it can function as a type of uh, type of chaperone for snare complex assembly. And when neurotransmitters are released uh, multiple times rapidly, this leads to disassembly and reassembly of snare complexes and this process uh, needs quality control or else those uh, uh, intermediate snare uh, complexes can become reactive and cause damage and in a in a an amazing paper in science it, she generated uh, triple knockouts of alpha beta and gamma synucleins and showed that these had uh, profound neurological impairments but importantly they had uh, decreased snare complex assembly and she showed that alpha synuclein can directly bind and uh, to snare proteins and promote snare complex assembly. So uh, this revealed a new function for uh, for alpha synuclein as a kind of chaperone for for snares. And then she went on in subsequent papers, uh, including a, a comprehensive paper in the Journal of Neuroscience, where she made systematic mutations across the entire alpha synuclein coding region and separated the normal functions from the pathological functions of synuclein and provided insight into what different domains contribute to what. She continues to be interested in the proteins and mechanisms that are important for uh, neurotransmitter release and snare complex assembly in her own laboratory with a, function, with a focus on other uh, presynaptic proteins, which she'll, uh, which she'll tell us about. Uh, please take it away, Jacqueline. Thanks, Aaron, for the very nice intro, and thanks again for the invitation and the opportunity to present our work here. Um, so as Aaron pointed out, um, when I started my lab, we became interested in proteins, you know, other than synuclein. We're still working on synucleins, and I'm going to talk here about our findings on MONK18, also called STXPP1. Um, so what do we know about STXPP1-linked encephalopathies? Um, originally identified in 2008, it was the first mutation um, linked to a disease called Otahara syndrome. Um, many of those have developed into West syndrome, shown here at the bottom. Um, and, you know, it's been a couple of years since then. And while you see here, there's a lot of epileptic um, syndromes linked to mutations in MARC-18 or STXPP1. More recently, a lot of non-epileptic syndromes have popped up as well. And that's simply due to the case that genetic testing is becoming cheaper. And um, we expect um, these results still to be skewed towards epilepsy due to um, the higher prevalence in those panels in, in epileptic patients. So regarding mutations, this I should say is already outdated. So we published this in 2020, shown here are the only the missense mutations in SDXBP1, and you can pretty much see yourself there all over the protein from the very beginning to the very end. 
And even if you look at um, at the, the member at, at the protein fold, also here there's no particular hotspot or area in in MONK18 that's particularly affected. And for completion, besides those missense mutations shown here, there's a variety of nonsense mutations, splice site mutations, frame shifts, and whole gene deletions. But those include mostly also other genes, and not only um, MONK18. And so at the time we started this in 2014, we only had about 30 mutations now. So you can see yourself, this has kind of exploded in the recent years. Um, the molecular mechanism underlying these diseases was entirely unknown. And this um, obviously resulted in that there was no disease modifying treatment other than focusing on reducing the seizure activity. Um, real quick, what does MONK18 do? MONK18 uh, one functions in synaptic neurotransmitter release, and I don't think I have to tell you much about this, but real quick, in order to propagate signals between neurons, um, synaptic vesicles have to fuse with the plasma membrane to release neurotransmitters. And um, essential for this process are snare proteins, synaptoremin 2 or VAMP2 on the synaptic vesicle, and syntaxin 1 shown here in green, and SNAP25 and yellow on the plasma membrane. And what MONK18 does, it, it, does, it um, prevents um, uncontrolled snare complex formation. So it's, it has a chaperone function to prevent syntaxin 1 from forming the complex here, which ultimately leads to vesicle fusion. But it also has a um, promoting function in that it um, binds to the fully assembled snare complex and facilitates fusion. It does not only bind to syntaxin 1, but it has other binding partners at the synapse. And um, I would say there, the list is growing, but the most, um, I don't want to call it established, the most studied ones include also DOC2 proteins on the synaptic vesicle, REP3, which binds to synaptic vesicles, and MINT proteins, which are part of the active zone. And really striking is if you look at, um, at um, uh, neurotransmitter release in absence of MAC18, um, published here in 2000, this is spontaneous synaptic activity um, in, in, in embryonic um, neurons, um, essentially removing MAC18 leads to complete uh, abolishment of neurotransmitter release. And so we came in with the questions, um, how do mutations in MAC18 affect this function and um, how do they trigger disease? And so when we, when we started um, this work, um, we, we had a, a colleague who was very heavily involved in worm work and we decided to jump into the worm field as well simply because the nervous system is simple, the worm has a short half-life, most importantly knockout of the worm homologue of MONK18 called ANK18 is not lethal so we could actually study um, um, its, its loss of function unlike knockout in mice and flies and um, obviously disease relevant residues that we decided to study were highly conserved in the ANK18 sequence. And um, for those of you not familiar with the worm, so this is how a wild type worm looks. Um, I always call it, they call it probably elegance because of the elegant behavior. And then this is a, an ANK18 null worm. Um, it's not dead, the movie's playing. It's just very, very slow. And the reason why it's not lethal in this worm is that um, worms rely more on gap junctions for neural communication than, than mammals do. And that's why this worm survives. And on top of that, they're hermaphrodites. So they essentially, the, the, the progeny is, you, you can find right next to the worm, they're laying eggs. And then, you know, it's like, it's like you can have generations next to each other. So when we studied this locomotion behavior, you can count body bands for a certain time frame. This is a regular wild type worm, the Ankhnal worms. You can see essentially not much movement and we could rescue that by reintroducing wild type Ank18 in these null worms. So what about the mutants? Um, we decided to study these mutants just because when we, when we started the study, these were the most prevalent ones. So you can see here the mutants um, rescue to a certain degree, but not quite as much as wild type Ank18. And I should say this here is transgenic expression. Of, um, of these mutants. So we also generated um, crispr knock in worms. And also here we see a reduction in locomotion. So um, not completely impaired, but impaired. We then looked at synaptic transmission and the worm is a great system if you don't know how to do electrophysiology, which is what we don't know how to do. So what we measure here is we measure paralysis of the worm in response to aldicarb. Um, aldicarb is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So 
the, the more you release, the quicker the paralysis occurs and the less neurotransmitter release occurs, the slower the paralysis occurs. And this is to show that our worms, our null worms that we rescued with wild type onc 18 essentially looked like the wild type worm strain that it's the generic worm strain. Then here, if we looked at our mutants, we found for three out of our four mutant strains, a uh, quite significant reduction in neurotransmitter release. Um, while these studies were going on, um, we got a conditional mock ET knockout mice from the Ferhaga lab in the Netherlands. Um, here, exon 2 is flanked by LOX P sites. So what we do is we culture neurons from those mice and then um, use lentiviral vectors to express either Cre to remove um, MONC18 or delta Cre as a control. You can see it, this is quite efficient. We're not getting a complete knockout, but I would say a very, very efficient knockdown and we're not affecting um, neuron survival in the time frame we're, we're looking at. So we cultured those neurons in a multi-electrode array. So these are the electrodes, these are the neurons. And then it's essentially like a black, black box. Um, the, the array measures parameters like um, mean firing rate, bursts, burst frequencies, spike rate. And, and this is how the data look. So what you see is from the top to the bottom are the 16 electrodes. And then over time here is the firing. These little blips is um, neural activity. And when you get a purple bar, this indicates network activity defined as the activity of six electrodes at the same time. Um, so this essentially here demonstrates when, we're, when we have a um, strong knockdown of um, on 18 and as you expect, there's not much firing going on. If you reintroduce wild type, we get significant activity back. And um, with the mutants, you can see it's somewhere in the middle, except for this mutant. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on this one. This is a special mutant. I'm happy to discuss this in the questions. And this is the quantification where we get good firing with wild type rescue, but not very good firing with either of the mutants that we looked at. And so another assay we looked at um, is to assess synaptic vesicle cycling. And for this, we utilized an assay that's been used for decades. It's an antibody uptake assay. And the idea is um, we bathe our neurons in a solution containing antibodies to synaptotadmin. We stimulate um, vesicles exocytose. The epitope becomes accessible to the antibody, um, binds. And then, you, know, you let this run for a certain amount of time, you wash, and you can measure the amount of, of endocytose um, antibody. And this is what's shown here. Um, essentially, you look at the green dots that are not um, in the soma, because the soma always gives a lot of background. So what we found is under no activity, very low signal, uh, neurons with high knockdown of ANC18, very little activity, wild type neurons um, cycle a lot, and then the mutants shown here, those five bars, significantly less. So overall, um, we conclude that mutations in ANC18 cause severe impairments in neuron function. And then since we're a molecular lab, we're really interested in what is the molecular mechanism underlying these deficits. And um, we started with the hypothesis that it's very likely that monk 18 mutants are unstable and misfold simply due to the fact that, as you can see here, they're all over the protein. And again, here in, in blue are the ones we decided to study for the given reasons. So very first um, assay to look at this is to look at how much protein do we do have actually left in, in these neurons. So we cultured those conditional knockout neurons um, transduced with Cree virus shown here. And then we reintroduced either wild type monk 18 or either of these five mutants. It's quantified here. You can see that, let's call it the funny mutation is somewhere in the middle and the other mutants are almost not expressed. And we found that this was not due to um, less protein being made here by qPCR. Um, MR levels were similar across the row but um, due to increased turnover. And we did this a couple of ways. I would just like to show this assay simply because it's pretty <laughs> and uh, it makes the point the best. So what we did here is we fused um, monkey T wild type or mutants to Dendra 2, which can be photoconverted. So essentially um, your protein appears GFP tagged here. You expose it to blue signal. Uh, to blue light, it converts to red. And then over a certain time frame, um, we decided 24 hours, you can follow the amount of fluorescence um, as an indicator of protein degradation. So this is how wild type looks. Um, this is how the mutants look. And if we quantify this at 24 hours, we see also here that the mutants um, 
um, degrade at a faster rate compared to wild type. I should say we confirmed this also in, in cultured neurons, and we also used cyclohexamide chase experiments, which all gave um, very, very similar results. And you can already see that here in the wild type, uh, MAN-K18 is nicely filling the cytosol, and so that's the P335L mutation, whereas these other mutants form these punctate structures um, in within the cell. So um, we asked the question, and I have to move them out of the way. Um, we asked the question, um, do, do monkey T mutants misfold? Because this was very highly indicative to us um, for protein aggregation. Um, and to assess this, there's a couple of ways to assess this. Um, I'm showing the, the easiest assay is a detergent solubility assay. So we used neurons that expressed either wild type or monkey teen. We um, solubilized them with the detergent Triton X100 and then separated soluble to, um, and insoluble protein as a measure of protein solubility. And this is shown here, soluble, insoluble for wild type, soluble, insoluble, soluble, insoluble. And if you quantify then the amount of soluble protein here, you can see that the mutants are significantly less soluble compared to wild type monkey teen. Um, this again was confirmed by other assays, for example, using uh, limited proteolysis experiments, which um, do not rely on detergents. So this was not anything um, um, uh, artificial introduced by the detergent. So insolubility, great, but can we actually see aggregates? Do those mutants form aggregates? And to do this, we generated GFP tag variants of wild type and mutant monk 18. And this is how wild type looks in our neurons. It's distributed essentially throughout the neuron. Um, P335L looked essentially very similar, but the mutants had these uh, funny puncta popping up um, in the neurons as well. Um, we also looked at our worms. So we generated a, a wild type expressing worm tag with a GFP. And what you see here is imaging along the ventral nerve cord. The big blobs are the soma and the line are axons and dendrites that are aligned in the worm along the nerve cord. And if we look at, at one mutant that we generated, you can see that this subcellular distribution is essentially gone. We're, we're uh, losing entirely the wild type um, distribution. What we get are these, um, these inclusion buddies here and they're very characteristic for the worm. They usually come in pairs. Um, um, accumulate in the soma and are also very indicative of protein aggregation. And then last, because we eventually were very interested in developing a screening platform for, for you know, finding strategies to revert this, we also generated yeast models. Um, and also here, wild type in P3 through 5L nicely filled the cytosol, whereas these mutants formed the same kind of inclusion bodies that we've seen in the worms and also in the neurons. Um, and then, um, you know, we thought, is that it? Is it loss of MONK18 that's causing all of this? Or is there a potential of the missense mutations to do something beyond just losing function, especially with this aggregation phenotype? And this was kind of initiated by um, Frederick Munier's group in Australia, where they found that um, some of those mutants co-aggregated with alpha synuclein. So we didn't go down that route, but we asked if mutant um, MONK18 is doing something to wild type MONK18. So the way we set up this assay here is again, we cultured neurons here, heterozygous neurons, infected them with Cree, and then reintroduced GFP tagged um, wild type or mutant variants. And then just looked at what happened to the still remaining endogenous MONK18 as a function of mutant. So again, the mutants very lowly expressed, almost not detectable. And very interestingly, whenever a mutant was in the neuron, the wild type levels also dropped significantly. Um, and this was due to um, co-aggregation. So we repeated our detergent solubility assay. Remember, tried the soluble versus insoluble. The mutants themselves are, are, um, of, are of lower solubility. And whenever they are lower soluble uh, variants are around, the wild type um, MONK18 also became slightly less soluble. Not a lot, but um, um, still significantly less soluble. We then generated also worms um, to kind of mimic the human situation. So we introduced um, mutations on top of the wild type in those worms and looked at locomotion. Also here, the mutants um, could not rescue as well as wild type in dark brown. Sorry, my cursor keeps disappearing. 
Um, we um, developed a heat shock assay, and the idea was that if you have a protein that's prone to misfolding, if you subject it to heat, that's likely accelerating the phenotype. So what you see here is wild type worms, they usually live at 20 degrees. So we subjected them to 37 Celsius over this time. And this is how they're paralyzed, they stop moving. And then mutant strains that expressed mutant and wild type together, they paralyzed significantly faster. And then last, we also looked at neurotransmitter release in those worms, again, using the aldicarb assay. And also here, the mutants in presence of wild type led to a significant reduction in neurotransmitter release. So to kind of sum up this part, we found that, um, I guess, you and me carrying two healthy copies of wild type monk 18, protein is being made, protein is being degraded, we're somewhere in, in, a, in a healthy range. Um, losing one copy leads to pretty much 50% of monk 18, um, which for the longest time um, we thought has no effect. However, it does. If we look closer, there are better models now out there that actually show these defects. And then if you have wild type and a mutant copy, mutant aggregates leads to co-aggregation of wild type and we're getting even lower in, in functional monk 18 levels um, somewhere in a, in a very critical level. So with this in mind, we asked, now that we kind of know what's going on, can we actually rescue these deficits that I've just shown you? And so um, our hypothesis, and at that point, I guess it was pretty naive. We just said, okay, let's try to stabilize Mark 18 and that should rescue its folding, stability, targeting, and function. So um, we started with that. And we went down to two routes. The first one, um, we looked at chemical chaperones. Um, they're terribly nonspecific. Um, there are osmolites that enhance protein folding and stability. So why did we look at them if they're terribly nonspecific? We looked because a lot of them are FDA approved for various diseases. So if we would get a hit, we could translate that pretty quickly to the clinic. And then we also went the route of pharmacological chaperones defined as being target specific. So they should only bind to monk 18 um, And I'm gonna now briefly go over those findings. So chemical chaperones. So we screened compounds essentially that we found in the literature to work in mice, to cross the blood brain barrier and to reverse protein aggregation or stop protein aggregation. And long story short, we tested this for wild type and one of one, one select mutant. And we found that three compounds um, did the job for phenylbutyrate, sorbitol and trehalose. So we tested those in primary mouse neurons expressing these mutants and found that yes, they stabilized even wild type monkey teen to a certain degree, but all the mutant um, protein levels went up. So obviously we're making more protein, but we make more functional protein. So we looked again at detergent solubility. Um, and also here, we assume wild type could not, boost, could not be boosted much because it's already at an optimal level, but the, the missense mutations shown here they benefited significantly from those compounds. We also looked at vesicle cycling and neurotransmitter release. And just to remind you, this is control. Um, and the more green, the better vesicle cycling is. And this is in presence of phenylbutyrate, sorbitol, and trehalose. And I should say it's pretty striking that with this little bit of rescuing of protein levels and solubility, we got essentially full rescue um, in, in uh, neurotransmitter release and vesicle cycling. Um, we also tested this in worms. So we fed the worms for several generations on those compounds and then looked at um, locomotion shown here. Also here, nice rescue, not so great with trehalose. The worms did not like that in particular. Um, our knock-in worms, very similar um, um, to the overexpressing worms, had a rescuing effect with these three compounds. And then in the aldicarb assay, which measures neurotransmitter release, also here we got full rescue with, with all three compounds. And so last, I think this is kind of the, the, the icing on the cake. Um, we looked at the worm again, and you know, just to get, get an idea if these aggregates reverse because they were pretty strong. So first of all, the compounds had no effect on wild type subcellular distribution. But if we looked at the mutant, you can see yourself, we got a pretty good restoration um, of, of subcellular distribution. And you know, it looked pretty much like a wild type worm. Since my students were blinded, it was undistinguishable, which was really, Hard to believe, but uh, I think they, I made them redo it about like 10 times because <laughs> I, I couldn't believe this recipe effect. So the idea is, yes, we can um, stabilize mutant monk 18 and can rescue insolubility. And the idea is that um, 
um, in conditions with, with wild type monkey teen, most of the protein is folded. If you have mutations in there, um, this equilibrium is shifted towards the misfolded state. And now if we introduce chemical chaperones, this gets partially pushed back towards the folded state and we're getting rescue of the deficits um, I've, I've shown you. And so um, I'm very excited to, to tell you that um, we've launched a pilot clinical trial about a year ago with my colleague here at Wild Cornell, who was on board since day one. And he said, knock on my door if you have something. And then we had something. So things are moving on. So forfenlibutyrate is FDA approved for urea cycle disorders. So uh, Zach can simply give it to kids. Um, we, as I said, we have a safety efficacy clinical trial um, going on and um, we're giving the kids the glycerol formulation simply because um, sodium for phenylbutyrate is terribly bitter and no kid ever wants to swallow it, but it comes with a cost. So it's still patent protected and runs at $300,000 per year in patient. Um, right now it's donated by Horizon Therapeutics and um, we'll see how this goes in the future. And let me just kind of share a success story. So what do we do with those kids? They come in for a four week observation period. They get an EEG, six weeks of exposure to the drug, um, second EEG, and then either we wean them off for VICT or they continue for up to a year. There's really no side effects. There's a bit of sleepiness, which can go away um, when we lower the dose. And the parents, a lot of them noted that the kids started smelling like wildflowers. So I guess that's also not a negative effect. And then just showing you two case studies. So what you see here is seizure frequency plotted, and this is over time. And this is a four-year-old boy. He has a micro deletion that includes SDXPP1. You can see he has significant seizure activity. And then once we was on Ravicti, here the blue um, stars or pluses, he's, he's completely seizure-free right now. And he keeps, um, his parents decided to, to keep him on Ravicti because they're very excited. This is an 11 year old boy, same story. He had um, significant seizures before taking Revic D. He has a truncation mutation, SDXP1, and also here after reaching the target dose, he's seizure free now. And I think this is also very encouraging. The boy is already 11 years old and that, you know, it works here um, is fantastic. And um, obviously, we're not only looking at seizure activity, the parents report, the kids are more engaged, you know, their parents just feel happier. And, and, and already that makes me very happy. So nonetheless, while all of this was going on and still is going on, we also asked, is there a way to specifically approach Mach 18 one And so I've mentioned before, we looked at pharmacological chaperones. I'm going to breeze through this because I know I'm running low on time. So we did a structure-based drug design together with Greg Petzko's lab. And um, we, um, uh, Andrew, the, the student in his lab, did a virtual screen for binding sites and identified these three sites. And we then um, ran a 250,000 compound library over these sites and um, picked the top compounds shown here, sorted according to binding site, site one, site two, site three. Um, and then my student tested all these compounds at these six concentrations for changes in total monk AT levels, synaptic activity in neurons, paralysis and aggregation in worms, and also for direct binding. Um, and you can read that up in the paper. All of this worked pretty well. We got an increase in levels. Um, we rescued synaptic activity. The worms became less paralyzed. We saw less aggregates and we could confirm direct binding of these three compounds here, compound nine for site one and compound 10 and 13 for site two. And it's exciting because if you compare these compounds by chance, they actually look very similar. Um, the part down here is the part that hangs out of the structure. So we now have access to some medicinal chemistry to modify those. And you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do about this, but um, they're very promising um, uh, initial molecules. And so what are we doing now? We're working on, are there other proteins and cellular pathways affected? And um, my students, um, are, are looking into specifically DOC2 and Syntaxin. Um, these have, we have found that those are affected by, by um, missense mutations in MAC-18. So levels go down, solubility goes down, targeting goes down. And um, maybe I can share this at some point later <laughs> when, when these studies are out, um, stay tuned. And so in summary, I've shown you that mutations in MAC-18 result in reduced protein levels of the mutant protein, the wild type protein, and um, quickly mentioned also in its binding partners, Syntaxin 1 and DOC2, and they were affecting neurotransmitter release at multiple levels. And I've shown you that we can actually rescue those deficits by stabilizing monkey teen with, with a couple of small molecules. 
And we'll quick outlook what we're doing now is we're, we're testing these molecules in vivo in heterozygous mice with and without carrying a missense mutation. And we're very much interested in, in looking at other dysfunctional pathways to explain the very um, um, diverse uh, phenotype spectrum in, in these patients. And with this, I'm done. I'd really like to thank Noah, Debbie, uh, um, and Anif for pushing these, these projects forward. Um, obviously, lab funding, trainee funding, and then the big thanks goes to the families and the Family Foundation, which you know give us a lot of energy to work even harder. And thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Awesome talk, Jacqueline. Really inspiring. And we're open for questions. So maybe I'll start. Um, do you think the chemical chaperones like trehalose and others are working specifically on the mutant monk 18? Or do you, do you think maybe they're having a more general effect on improving snare complex chaperoning? As I, as I said, these, these are so terribly nonspecific. Um, they may not even touch monk 18, you know, Maybe they work generically in protein folding. Maybe they work at the ER Golgi level. You know, um, I always joke we should all take four fin butyrate. It increases lifespan and worms. You know, it's maybe it's just a keeping keeping proteostasis in in a healthy state, and maybe that's what they do. Um, I can't tell. There's no study really out there looking at you know doing proper proteomics to even identify what are the targets. So we're, we're interested in doing that as well, just because you know it may lead to other compounds, but I can't tell. I just don't think it's specific, but it was a good first trial. But for example, in your assays where you see defects in snare complex assembly uh, caused by loss of synucleans, do you think these chemical chaperones would be able to buffer those or do you... Or do you I, think so? I don't think so. I think it's just not having enough functional protein at the synapse. And I think that's what's causing all these, these downstream effects. You know, um, syntaxin needs monk 18 to traffic uh, to the synapse. If you impair monk 18, syntaxin doesn't get there. And we're actually not looking at, at Golgi phenotypes. There's a pretty severe phenotype. Um, and it may all start there already. And then no wonder you have all these deleterious consequences downstream. Got it. And then in your trial, are you pre-screening the kids for the specific mutations that you know cause this uh, aggregation phenotype? Uh, no, we're not. And I should say it's still pretty controversial in the literature. If there is this dominant negative effect, we see it consistently. Others don't. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're going back and forth. The kids are not screened. The only criteria is they need to have seizures. So we have a readout and not all kids do. Um, and should be young, ideally younger, you know, so phenotypes have not established and it's just 20 patients right now. So we're, we're, going, we're planning on expanding this right now, given the, the very positive outcome of this trial. Got it. Uh, I so had a question, uh, Jacqueline. Hi. Hi. So, um, uh, I, I love I loved everything. I was wondering the, uh, you know, the inclusions that you showed in the neurons and also in the yeast and Aaron knows this well. You know, they remind me of the synuclein inclusions that we used to see because they are too round, too precise. And, uh, you know, in the, for the synuclein, as you know, they turn out to be vesicle uh, clusters. And I was just wondering, have you done an EM of those uh, inclusions that you see? I, I understand that you have the solubility acid, but... Uh, no, I would love to. We also wanted to do to isolate them and see what else is in there, you know, just to get a feeling what's co-aggregating. Um, they're not super stable. I don't think they're like synuclein inclusions per se type, um, but we should probably do EM. I, I the one in that. the east, you could probably yeah. do EM. Yeah, 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 agreed. Yeah. The other no, thing I was wondering, to do. Could, could you, if you just overexpress uh, the syntax in um, uh, the Mankadian, uh, would that I mean, I, I, I thought your data showed that you couldn't just overexpress it because the mutant would bind to it and stop the degradation. Is it true or could you overexpress the wild type protein and get away with it? The reason I'm asking is that because I wonder if you can do something like Zolgensma, you know. Yeah, 
so <laughs> you know we got dinged by reviewers saying all of your stuff is overexpression. It's 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 not physiologically relevant. So we actually titrated our virus from like very low to very high. You cannot express much more monk 18 than there is already for wild type. I think there's some kind of auto regulatory something going on. Um, we don't know. So I don't think you can go higher than maybe so another 20% uh, or so. Therapeutically, you cannot re-express the protein because there is some internal regulation that prevents, even, even like if you express the wild type protein in human neurons who have these mutations, the wild type protein will not be expressed. Um, my gut feeling, I can't say it probably will express, be, be expressed, but maybe not to, nice. you know, supplement a missing allele. Um, but I don't have data to support this, just my feeling. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, there's no other questions. That's a really exciting, inspiring talk, Jacqueline, going from mechanism to screen, screening to clinical trial and kids. So congrats. Sometimes and, you're uh, lucky, you know. <laughs> interestingly, phenylbutyrate, sodium phenylbutyrate is one of the components of a newly FDA approved drug for ALS. And mm -hmm. there's also a clinical trial now testing um, trehalose in ALS, uh, not, not sure the rationale for that, but uh, given emergence of synaptic, presynaptic proteins in, in ALS, uh, that might be interesting. Okay, um, so th thanks for coming and thanks Ching Feng for awesome talk as well and see thanks. everyone.